kind of mind blowing, isn't it? Yeah. Thinking that just one event could pack such a punch, literally changing coastlines and well, echoing in stories for hundreds of years. Absolutely. And speaking of power. You know, that Cascadia earthquake back in 1700, the one we're diving into, the energy it released, well, the tsunami it caused went clear across the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it actually left a mark in Japan, this kind of mysterious wave that nobody felt locally, a global footprint from uh, just one terrifying night. A truly global event. Welcome, everyone, to Seeking History. And it's that terror, isn't it? The um, the raw human side of experiencing that awful night. That's what we really want to explore today. Exactly. Here on Seeking History, our goal is always to dig up these, you know, really compelling bits of the past. And today we're looking at something immense, a cataclysm that hit the Pacific Northwest uh, way back on a winter night. Yeah. Try to picture it. Pitch black, middle of the night, and then bam, the ground just explodes. Violent shaking, and not just for a few seconds, for like five minutes straight. Five minutes? It's almost impossible to imagine. The absolute terror people must have felt. And then the aftershocks, you yeah. know, just keeping that fear alive, constantly reminding them it's it's chilling to think about. And sadly, it wasn't just fear. It caused, well, huge destruction and a terrible loss of life. The scale is just staggering. I mean, the shaking itself would have been horrific, but add the darkness, the total darkness, and then what came after right. the tsunami, it created this um, this night of just unimaginable horror for anyone living near the coast. So our mission today really is to try and understand how the indigenous peoples up and down the Pacific Northwest coast actually experienced this huge catastrophe and how they remembered it. Right. We'll be looking into their uh, their oral traditions, these really rich, varied stories passed down generation after generation. Communities from like Northern California all the way up to Vancouver Island. These stories are, well, they're a vital window, aren't they? They absolutely are. And it's so important to see these oral traditions, not just as, you know, myths or folklore, but as real historical accounts. They give us these firsthand views of an event that completely reshapes their world. It's basically our main way of seeing that terrible night through their eyes. OK, so let's try and paint a picture of that night. There's this one account um, often linked to an old chief mm. that gives us a real sense of it. it talks about this weird stillness beforehand, mm. like a heavy silence. Even the animals knew something was wrong. Dogs whining, birds just take, taken off silently. And then this roar from under the earth. The description is so vivid, like a thousand angry bears growling beneath the earth. What hits you about that first part? Well, it's that sense of the natural world almost predicting it, isn't it? The animals reacting. It suggests this really deep connection, this awareness of subtle signs that, you know, probably save lives sometimes. And that description of the roar, it really sets the scene for the violence to come. It's primal. And it ramps up so fast. The story goes on. Uh, longhouses groaning, twisting. The very buildings people lived in just contorting violently. Yeah. Imagine hearing your home, your safe place, basically screaming under that pressure. And then the river itself, it says, leaped out of its bed. Wow. Yeah. And the trees whipping around in a terrible frenzy. It just paints this picture of absolute terrifying chaos. It really does. The river jumping its banks, the trees thrashing. It shows the sheer power affecting everything, not just the human stuff, but the whole landscape. It would have felt like the world itself was breaking apart. And the shaking, they say, lasted for about... The time it takes to paddle across the Great Bay. Now, that's not just a quick jolt. Yeah, that's sustained. A long time to endure that kind of violent motion. A really long time. And then, just as it started, it stopped, leaving this, this deep, wrong silence. That silence, after all that noise and terror, must have been almost worse. Just heavy with dread. Oh, definitely. That sudden quiet after complete sensory overload, it would have been incredibly unnerving. Like, okay, what happens now? It really speaks to the... Um, the terrifying uncertainty of it all. And what happened next was, well, just as terrifying, maybe more so in a different way. The ocean pulled back, like way, way back, exposing the seabed, fish flopping around. Yeah. And the elders saw this, this totally bizarre sight. And apparently they knew instantly the warning went out to the mountains. Run. Don't look back. Mm. How do you think they knew what made them react like that? It suggests, well, maybe a deep memory, doesn't it? Perhaps stories passed down from smaller earlier events, maybe smaller tsunamis, or just an incredibly sharp understanding of the ocean and its signs right there in that moment of crisis. Their immediate grasp of the danger, it really highlights how crucial that environmental knowledge was for survival. 
And thank goodness for that warning, because then the sea came back. Yeah. But it wasn't just a big wave. It was described as a black wall of water taller than the tallest cedar. Unbelievable. Just bearing down on the land. Incredibly fast, incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. That image is just, wow. The scale there is just immense. A wave taller than the biggest trees. It, it captures the absolute uh, destructive force of the tsunami, swallowing the beach, then the village, then the forest. It shows how it just consumed everything. Yeah. And that detail, you know, about canoes being tossed into trees like they were nothing. Right. It really hammers home the power involved. And importantly, the mention of multiple waves that fits exactly with how tsunamis behave. It wasn't just one hit. It's just amazing that this whole sequence is absolutely horrific night. Yeah. Wasn't recorded you know, with pen and paper by the people living through it, not in the way we think of records now. Mm -hmm. Instead, for these indigenous communities, the memory was kept alive through, well, through their oral traditions. These intricate webs of stories, songs, ceremonies mm -hmm. passed down so carefully through the generations. And these traditions were their history books, their scientific observations, their survival guides all rolled into one. They preserved the collective memory, the trauma, but also the crucial lessons learned. It was, you know, a highly sophisticated way of holding and transmitting knowledge. Definitely. Though we also have to acknowledge um, collecting these stories later on wasn't always straightforward. True. Things like, you know, the devastating population losses from diseases brought by Europeans, plus the potential filters or biases of the non-Indigenous people who first wrote some of them down. Yeah. It means we might only be seeing fragments, right? That's a really critical point. The loss of life and culture has definitely impacted how these stories came down to us. And like any historical source, we need to think about who recorded it and why and what might have been missed or misinterpreted. But even with those caveats, the consistency is remarkable. Yeah, despite those challenges, when you look across uh, the different tribal traditions all the way from Northern California up the coast to Vancouver Island, you see these, these really striking common themes popping up again and again about that 1700 event. Hmm. It points to this shared massive trauma. Exactly. Finding those common threads helps us piece together a clearer picture of what it was like across the whole region. And one of the most consistent things is that sudden, incredibly violent shaking. Right. Like the Cowichan tradition from Vancouver Island talks about houses just being thrown down, landslides burying a whole village, specifically at night. That detail, the nighttime setting, it just amplifies the terror, doesn't it? Absolutely being caught totally unaware in the dark. And then there's the other huge one, <laughs> the great wave, the tsunami. You mm. hear it up and down the coast. Traditions in Oregon talk about the ocean pulling way back and this monstrous wave returning, just wiping out coastal villages. Sure. Terrible loss of life. And those details, like people desperately trying to tie their canoes to the tops of trees. Mm -hmm. Can you even imagine that level of panic? That image alone, trying to tie a canoe to a treetop, tells you everything about how high and powerful they perceived that wave to be. It wasn't just flooding. It was something totally outside their normal experience. And the fact that so many stories place it specifically at night, that's just chilling. Science now puts the quake around 9.00 p.m. January 26, 1700. Yeah. Being ripped from sleep by that kind of violence in total darkness, the psychological impact, the sheer vulnerability, it must have been overwhelming. The darkness would make everything worse, wouldn't it? The confusion, the noise, the earth roaring, buildings collapsing, maybe the sea starting to surge, all happening when you can't see anything. Just absolute terror and chaos. And the last big common thread seems to be the land itself changing. So many stories mention coastline sinking, forests just being drowned, permanent changes. Right. Okay. Which matches up incredibly well with the geology we see today, like those eerie ghost forests, dead cedars still standing in tidal zones, and the legends about whole forests just vanishing underwater. Those physical changes, the ghost forests especially, became these powerful, lasting reminders etched onto the landscape itself. They were like monuments to the event, symbols of its enduring power and the changes it brought. It's also really interesting how these, well, these terrifying world-altering events were often woven into their existing spiritual beliefs, their mythologies. Definitely. Like the stories you hear a lot about Thunderbird, you know, representing the sky, battling whale, representing the ocean and the underworld. Their fight was said to cause the earth to shake and the sea to rise. The Kilute and the Ho tribes, for instance, have really strong traditions about this cosmic battle. What does that tell us? 
It shows how they made sense of something so immense and, frankly, terrifying within their own understanding of the world. It wasn't just random destruction. It was part of a larger cosmic narrative connecting their experience to these powerful forces. It provided a framework, a meaning, even in the face of such chaos. In these stories, they weren't just explanations, were they? They often carried vital survival knowledge. It's warning people, sometimes subtly, sometimes directly, about living too close to the water and telling how people escaped by running to higher ground. That famous piece of advice, when the water runs away, run the other way. That's life-saving information embedded right in the story. Precisely. They weren't just abstract myths. They were practical guides, teaching people to recognize warning signs and what to do, essential knowledge passed down through narrative. And you see these memories play out in really specific ways in different communities, mm -hmm. like, uh, the Pachina Bay people on Vancouver Island, their story is stark, the shaking at night, the huge waves smashing the village, wiping it out. But the people who lived higher up at a place called Molotil say yes, they survived. That's such a powerful localized example. It shows the direct link between location and survival, reinforcing that lesson about higher ground found in the broader tradition. Yeah. And the Cowichan people also on Vancouver Island, they have their own traditions, a huge nighttime earthquake, houses collapsing, landslides. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the Maka at Nia Bay. Stories of a massive flood, canoes ending up in trees, many people dying. Though, as you mentioned, some details there might not perfectly fit a standard tsunami model, which is interesting in itself. Right. These variations are important. They show the unique local experiences and how memories might evolve or merge over time within specific communities. And the Ho and Kilute, tying it back to Thunderburn Whale, they have some incredibly vivid accounts. The Ho version describes this great storm, hail, lightning in a blackened sky, this huge thunder noise, yeah. all happening alongside a great shaking, jumping up and trembling of the earth beneath, and a rolling up of the great waters. I mean, that sounds almost like an eyewitness report just framed within their cosmology. It really does. That Ho description is one of the most direct and dramatic accounts we have from the oral traditions. It shows perfectly how a real historical event got deeply woven into their existing cultural and spiritual narratives. Then there are the Kalalam, with a flood story that mentions salty rivers and canoes and trees, details that hinted something much bigger than just a river flood. Mm. And down south, the Yurok in California have that incredibly evocative story title, How the Prairie Became Ocean. Wow. Yeah, a clear memory of the land suddenly sinking what scientists call co-seismic subsidence and the tsunami that followed. Each one adds another piece to the puzzle, showing how widespread the impact was and the different ways people experienced and remembered it all along the coast. The Tolodini further south in Oregon, they tell these chilling stories of the ocean being sucked back so far that the whales were left on mud. Goodness. Followed by a wave that just swallowed the land. Mm. And at Kewichan, again, they even have winter dances that actually reenact the earthquake. That shows how deeply it was embedded in their culture, right? Mm. Memorialized through ritual. Absolutely. Those ceremonial reenactments are powerful. They show the lasting cultural weight of the event, making sure the memory and its lessons were actively kept alive, felt, and passed on physically. And it wasn't just ceremonies. It was in everyday teachings, too. The Chinook and Clatsop peoples taught their kids about earthquake weather, told them to run uphill if the ocean pulled back. Practical knowledge. Exactly. The Nuchinulf had an earthquake dance mimicking the tremors, ending with everyone rushing to safety, like a drill, but as a cultural performance. And the Tillamook, they talked about those ghost forests as reminders that the land wasn't permanent, stories of forests sinking overnight. It just illustrates how completely this event was woven into the fabric of their lives, their education, their culture, their understanding of the very ground beneath their feet. The Coquille in Southern Oregon, they remembered the night of the broken earth. They passed down warnings about specific places not to go back to, and they had their own legends about the ghost trees mm -hmm. and the Grand Run tribes from the Oregon coast. Similar stories. A huge tidal wave, trees ripped up, villages carried away, and that recurring image again, people trying to tie canoes to the very tops of trees. It really is incredible how consistent these core elements are across so many different groups and over such a vast area, all pointing to this one huge earthquake and tsunami around 1700, passed down purely through spoken word for centuries. And the really compelling part now is how modern science, especially in the last few decades, has just overwhelmingly backed up the timing and the details in these ancient memories. It's been amazing to see. 
yeah, like studies of tree rings showing sudden stress or death, analyzing sediment layers for sand washed inland by a huge wave, the tsunami deposits, and even those orphan tsunami records found in Japan, dated January 27, 1700. It all points right back to that night, January 26, 1700, around 9 p.m. Pacific time. The match is just astonishing. It really is a remarkable convergence. The geology finding those sunken forests exactly where stories said the land sank, finding sand layers far inland, just as the tsunami stories describe its powerful validation of that traditional knowledge. It confirms the accuracy of the oral record in such a concrete way. So when you step back and look at the whole picture, what's the main takeaway here? I mean, it's clear these indigenous memories are so much more than just interesting old stories. Oh, absolutely. They're like this incredibly detailed archive, aren't they? Historical geological they offer a spiritual way of understanding the world mm -hmm. and they contain these absolutely vital lessons about the power of the earth about humility about respect for the land exactly these oral traditions give us this invaluable long-term view of the hazards right here in the cascadia region they remind us these massive events aren't just random they're part of a much longer cycle and the stories hold crucial wisdom about being prepared, about community resilience, mm -hmm. and about the absolute necessity now more than ever of combining that traditional ecological knowledge with modern science to understand and hopefully lessen the risks we face in the future. This whole convergence just powerfully underlines how valid and valuable indigenous knowledge systems are as history and even as science. It really hammers home the, uh, the sheer impact of that 1700 quake on the people who lived here then. Yeah that night of terror, the devastation. Yeah. And yet somehow their stories carry that memory forward. And those stories still have so much to teach us, don't they? Not just about this one historical moment, but about how memory works, how resilience happens, and the incredible wisdom that can be held in oral traditions. It definitely makes you wonder yeah. what other vital knowledge about our planet, about our past, might still be held in oral traditions elsewhere in the world. Knowledge that's maybe waiting for us to just listen, to acknowledge it, maybe even reshape how we see history or the earth itself it really shows how important it is to value different ways of knowing it absolutely does recognizing and respecting these diverse knowledge systems just makes our understanding of the world and our place in it so much richer so much deeper well thank you for joining us on this deep dive into history we really hope this exploration of the indigenous memories of the 1700 cascadia earthquake gave you a powerful look into the past and maybe uh, a new appreciation for just how enduring stories can be. We definitely encourage you to keep seeking out these fascinating stories from our shared past. This has been Seeking History. Join us next time as we explore another compelling story from the annals of time.